eight years ago, eight years ago, precisely today, I was sitting in uh, the embassy of Ecuador in London and meeting with Julian Assange. And for me, it's been a great honor because what I ignore and I discovered by then is that it's someone who has such a knowledge of things, someone who has such a working power, and at the same time, something, someone who's extremely kind, very accessible. So I felt really blessed to have been able to uh, discuss for more than four hours. And as I said, it was a great pleasure because in life you meet so many people and only a few of them stay in your memory and Julian is one of them. This is the first thing. Second thing I wanted to mention is that as we all know Julian has left the embassy of Ecuador more than four years ago and has been locked in prison in Belmarsh. And we can wonder what has changed since. And in Europe in the EU, so many laws have been passed to protect whistleblowers. But in fact, when we see reality, what has changed? Everyone talks about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, about independence of journalism, about protecting whistleblowers, about human rights. And somehow, Europe, and I'm French in the country of human rights, I am ashamed to say that we are the laughing stock of the planet. I don't know if you've seen this interview from the BBC, a uh, woman, a journalist, interviewing the president of Azerbaijan. And the president of Azerbaijan just makes fun of this British journalist because she talks about Julian Assange. In order to accuse me, saying that Armenians will not have free uh, media here. Let's talk about Assange. How many years, sorry, how many years he spent in Ecuadorian embassy? And for what? And where is he now? For journalistic activity. You kept that person hostage, actually killing him morally and physically. You did it, not us, and now he's in prison. So you have no moral right to talk about free media when you do this thing. So today, I would like to talk to you all about the truth. Many of you have children, many of us have children. Do we like when our children lie to us? Obviously, we don't. Why? Do we like when our husband, our wife, our partner likes, lies to, to us? Obviously not. So why do we teach our children to tell the truth whereas the adults all live in a world of lies? And this is the famous quote from Edward Snowden, which I will read because I don't want to make a mistake. He declared a couple of years ago, you can't imagine how difficult it is to expose the truth in a world of people who are unaware that they live in a world of lies. So talking about children and talking about the truth, I would like all of us to think about Julian Assange's little boys who are growing up in this world of lies. What kind of world are we showing these children knowing that their father is the one who exposed the lies? The decisions being made behind hidden doors how can we say that we are democracies protecting our children? Because only dictatorships separate children from their parents. I would also like to mention that I am the only French person who's published a book with an introduction from Julian Assange. And I published it in French and in English. By that time, I was one of the whistleblowers in France whose media had been focusing on. And since I published that book, I was absolutely neglected, put aside. Who has a book with an introduction from Julian Assange, which is so powerful because the text is absolutely 
unbearable and I will never thank him enough to have him accepted to write this text for me. So not a single media talked about it, not a single NGO, not a single union. Why not? We are all the ones who say that they stand on the side of the truth, on the side of whistleblowers, on the side of Julian Assange. Why is there such a silence? I've been wondering for years, and now I understand. It's very clear. We live in a society where one likes complaints, where one likes victims. But if you grow out of your status of victim and propose solutions, then you are the one to be put aside, crushed, discriminated, and harassed and abandoned. As far as I'm concerned, it's not being locked in a jail like Julian in England, but as a French person, it's social isolation, it's um, professional isolation. So somehow we put people who bother the system totally aside in a very deep and uh, conscious silence. This is a shame. Our democracies all are in danger because of all these lies of our politicians. We pass laws on one side and the first ones not to respect the laws are the ones in power and our governments. When President Hollande was the president of France, I sent him an, a number, a very important number of letters regarding the asylum and the protection of both Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. All the answers I've received at where, sorry, we can't do anything. We cannot do anything. Unfortunately, we cannot do anything. So France, the country of human rights, who cannot do anything for people who are persecuted abroad and who have um, who have given information regarding the fact that my country was suffering mass surveillance, namely our president Sarkozy, Hollande, even Chihai. Those people are not protected. So who do our presidents protect? It's a shame because our reputation is at stake. And according to what's going on, Today, on an international scale, they'd rather pay really careful attention to all the citizens of the world. Because you cannot squash people and be violent and be mean without bearing the consequences of your acts. Francois Hollande, when Julian wrote to him, I think Julian referred to it as an open letter, but it was referred to in the press as Julian asking, uh, as was his right, for asylum. In France. Uh, he did I remember this, talking to him about that, yes, absolutely. He did this on uh, his birthday, his 44th birthday, July 3rd, 2015, and according to the internet, the response was immediate. I quote Francois Hollande The situation of Mr. Assange does not present any immediate danger. He is also the target of a European arrest warrant. Yes, this is exactly what the Elysee wrote to me, absolutely. And it was a couple of uh, weeks before this happened. And then I met Julian, so obviously we talked about that. You are telling you that they are powerless. So if our president are powerless to protect people in danger, and namely France, country of human rights, who've been welcoming for generations, for years, for decades, people who were persecuted in their own countries, you know, France has welcomed people from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, from South America. And we cannot protect someone like Julian Assange, who's a journalist, published the truth, and who explained that our presidents were being listened to by a foreign power. What does it mean about their skills, about their honesty, and about the interests they work with? Who have been... Uh, who have they been elected by? By people or by multinational companies or by foreign states? I mean, it's a shame. It's terrible. What did Julian say to you about it that you're able to discuss? You say you talked to Julian about this. Yes, I did. We did. 
Is there anything that you were able to disclose about what he said regarding seeking asylum in France while he was an asylee in Ecuador, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London? Well, as I said before, I mentioned the fact that I had written to François Hollande several of times to ask for the protection and the asylum of both Julian and Edward Snowden. And I remember that I forwarded the letter then to Julian, who needed that for his lawyers, because as you know, it's an international case. It's not only the fact that he was locked here in England and that now he's in prison in Belmarsh. It's about the fact that others do not do anything, namely the ones who are supposed to promote human rights, to protect human rights, to build their reputation about human rights. It's hypocrisy. It's lies once again. We live in a world of lies, it's what I was saying before. Nobody realizes how deep the day people wake up and understand the, the, the depths, the width of the lies, everyone will be flabbergasted. Because it's not one citizen here being crushed or one citizen there. It's a whole of a society, a whole of a system which works like this. The ones who lie, the ones who shut up, are the ones being promoted. This is it. You're a whistleblower yourself. You blew the whistle on a Swiss-French financial institution and you managed to bring back funds that uh, were uh, tax evasion monies and uh, laundered monies back to the French people. Uh, a huge amount of money. Um, do, do you want to tell us how much? Billions of euros were brought to the French government, and I was somehow a star. I don't like to quote it. Until the fact that our minister of budget, who was saying, who was declaring under François Hollande that he was fighting tax evasion, until it was discovered that he himself had offshore bank accounts at UBS in Switzerland, which were bribes from a pharmaceutical laboratory, which helped him finance political party. I do not have, and I have never had a foreign bank account, not now and not in the past. Do you see how deep this goes? This is absolutely crazy. And we're not talking about what so-called extremist parties we're talking about the ones in power in France since World War II. But how do you feel about a very famous whistleblower, Chelsea Manning, um, and the seven years that she was imprisoned for the leaks that she provided to WikiLeaks? First, what we can say is that she had a tremendous courage. I mean, doing this is absolutely above any expectations, because when you know that what can happen to a whistleblower, the risks are massive. And she suffered, and she may still suffer from what has happened to her. She showed somehow the fact that everything that's important, we are surrounded today by thousands of people, that what matters to everybody is peace, and is the truth, and this is obviously what we do not know. We ignore what's going on because the decisions are being taken behind closed doors against us. What did Chelsea Manning do? Well, namely with collateral murder, we understood that somehow human beings, citizens, are being treated as if they were just uh, characters in a um, computer game. Uh, on the video game and somehow were the targets of guys who play in a helicopter or and that somehow we are in a virtual world. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. Keep shoot. Keep shoot. Keep shoot. We need to move time now. Alright, we just engaged all eight individuals. We're still fire. Life, blood, heart doesn't exist anymore. When you're able to shoot journalists, because we can remind the ones who listen that there were two journalists from Reuters who were executed 
no, that they were children, that they were citizens hanging around in the streets of their city. They cannot even walk peacefully. They are just the targets of two, shall we call them crazy people? I don't know how we should call them. They obeyed orders or they did that on their own. But somehow, who's punished? Is it the ones who kill? Or is it the ones who just point at saying, well, those are killers? And of course, we have the answer. The one who stand up is the one who's supposed to be executed. So once again, we go back to what I said earlier. We teach our kids, all of us, to tell the truth. We do not want our kids to lie to us. We are not expecting our partner to lie to us either. So why do we live in this world of lies? Lies from politicians, lies from journalism, media mainstream, lies from politicians, lies from uh, NGOs sometimes. Where are we? Where are we? So when you turn out a to be a whistleblower, somehow it's not only a problem against your company or against uh, the employer you blow the whistle on. Then you discover that all that is like a spider web. Everything is connected. And uh, you know Roger Waters, who's one of Julian's supporters, he produced an album a couple of years ago called them and us and this is exactly it. we are us the people and they are them the so-called elites i don't like the world but the ones ruling the world on a political point of view economical point of view financial point of view legal point of view and all of them just you know fight on uh, tv shows to show that there's a kind of uh, a challenge here somewhere, but when the cameras turn off, they all are very friendly with each other and they just decide, make decisions against us, the people. Why isn't Julian Assange a free man? He's a journalist who published uh, accurate information from uh, Chelsea Manning, namely. Uh, it's beyond uh, expectation. How come? Edward Snowden be in Russia and not in Europe. I mean, it's, it's something like nobody can understand except when you have a story like mine, when you've been squashed by everybody, when you've been put aside by everybody, you just realize that when it is too dangerous for the ones in power, you have to be eliminated, a way or another. You're far away from your country, you're in prison, you have trials, endless trials. And this is a way to make sure that there is not a new person who would stand up and disclose information extremely uh, sensitive, uh, for the ones in power. Today is the 1600th day that he has spent in Belmarsh. But let's go back to eight years ago today, August 28th, 2015. You went to visit him in the Ecuadorian embassy. What was it like when you were approaching the embassy? Were there those crowds of people outside? And then when you went in, what was it like when you went in? When I arrived at the embassy, there were cops outside because by that time in 2015, the UK government was still paying for policemen to somehow keep an eye on the embassy. So when I arrived, there was a cop as well in the corridor, because when you arrive in this little building, uh, the embassy of Ecuador is on the left-hand side, and then in the lobby, you had a policeman asking me where I was going to and why I was going to the Ecuadorian embassy. Well, so I had to decline my identity and uh, to explain that I was visiting Julian Assange. I had absolutely no choice. And when I arrived in the embassy, I had to give my cell phone and I had to wait for Julian in the big room, which we see everywhere on all the interviews he had been given and all the meetings he had with Stella and his lawyers and uh, friends, etc. And we had a four-hour meeting. It was a very, very long meeting. We talked at length. 
about loads of subjects. The fact that you know nobody's protected here in England, nor in the US, nor nowhere in the world. So we talked about potential solutions. One of them is to gather internationally and to speak in one voice. And we see that this is crucial. Everything is made to divide and rule. It's very, very hard to speak in one voice. So we talked about lots of subjects linked to, obviously, you, you mentioned um, Chelsea Manning, but we talked about other whistleblowers, namely because I know someone called uh, Rudolf Elmer, and Rudolf Elmer was working in uh, Swiss Bank, and uh, he disclosed information and has been twice in jail in Switzerland, and he had met Julian here, and uh, there was a press conference where he had given him uh, DVDs, which have been uh, highlighted uh, everywhere uh, in the media on an international scale. He is, uh, I understand, going through a prosecution uh, in Switzerland. He is a whistleblower, uh, and he has important things to say. Yeah. No, it's not about this. What I wanted to say here, and I think that's important again, very important, I believe. I tried to get universities involved, approach people there to educate the society through a university to say, look, these are the information we have, but it doesn't work. Universities where I, who, which I approached, they turned it down. It's not important for them. I don't know why, but it's not important. So I choose to be, uh, the path of WikiLeaks again to educate society. So we talked about Rudolf Elmer and his case. We talked about other international cases and uh, wondered how you know we can all move on. And it was yeah eight years ago, and when we see the situation nowadays, eight years later. We have a reason sometimes to be sad and depressed. However, there's also here and there a seed of hope because it's true that things slowly evolve. Slowly, scandal after scandal, people start realizing that there is something that's wrong. So, The, the, yeah, the meeting was uh, very dense. I, I left, I was exhausted, and I, I remember I was like, how come being locked and being in the situation in which he is, can he be as, you know, s um, so straightforward, so uh, focused, so smart? I, I was really impressed. It's, uh, if I had to die today, I think that one of the events of my life would have to we said it with you ages ago. I have been extremely, uh, yeah, I, 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 with, I, I think about it with lots of emotion because uh, it's unbelievable to put aside people who have so many good ideas for humanity. I hear you about Julian. I remember that WikiLeaks wasn't able to get any, to receive any dotations anymore, and I remember that they were disconnected from the Visa or American Express or whichever credit card system. And I remember that they had problems with their bank accounts. So I don't know if it's linked to the Julius Bar story, but I wouldn't be surprised knowing how powerful Swiss banks are. It's unbelievable. This one, when I heard the scandal of Julius Bar. And don't forget that at the same time, 2008, we had the HSBC scandal. So it's like, a, so it's not only UBS. It's That's the them. bank that you work at. I, I work for UBS. It's all of them. What kind of game do they play, which everyone ignores? Because back then, it was 15 years ago already, 2008. Nobody was talking about tax evasion. Nobody was talking about the debt the crisis about the money missing in the coffins of the of the governments etc and I was like how come with all this information are in the government somehow standing up on the side of the citizens the ones who pay their taxes because they have no choice they are just little employees and we are 
hundreds of millions everywhere, at least here in Europe. And this is how you understand little by little how the system works, is that somehow they all are in bed together. So I wouldn't be surprised if some bank or other, uh, or some group of banks together, uh, were orchestrating to uh, get WikiLeaks banned from PayPal and Visa and Mastercard, etc. But um, have you noticed that this past two, three, four years, there haven't been a single public whistleblower since our stories since 2008? Because there were lots of scandals back then in the, what we call the first um, financial crisis. There hasn't been a single whistleblower since in the finance industry. And why not? Because according to what happened to Rudolf Elmer, to someone like me, who would take the risk to tell the truth? And when you are on other subjects such as Snowden or, I don't know, uh, you saw it with the COVID crisis, the doctors who tried to talk in China about this uh, uh, virus, etc. When you see that anyway, wherever you are on the planet, whatever the alert is, whether you are a man or a woman, whether you are young or a senior, whether you are an executive or an employee, it's always the same. The one who talks, who's being criticized, who's being put aside, who has to go to court and explain himself or herself, with all the ones who just lie in front of massive populations, they all are being recycled. You know, in France, when we have a rogue politician, is recycled in Brussels. It's just an example. You understand how appropriate, how violent, how cruel, how unfair this is. It has nothing to do with human rights. It has nothing to do with democracy. And then I tell you, we have the president of Azerbaijan who makes fun of us. We are the laughing stock of the planet. We, France, start having very big problems with Africa, with former African colonies because our French politicians have been absolutely unable to manage an ethical relationship. It's always been a domination relationship. Obviously it's nothing people from people, because people are people everywhere. But as it goes with corrupted government each time, then it creates wars, it creates hates, it creates violence. But come on, and this is what Julian says, it was on, on the subject of discussion we had. We all are for peace. And they lie to us to take us into those wars, whereas we have to gather for peace. Who wants to have his children being shot? Who wants to have his children in jail for political ideas? And as I said earlier, only dictatorship separate children from their parents. I, I want to read out a quote from the Center for Investigative Journalism that Gavin McFadden founded in 2003 about you. Her documents have widely helped to identify 38,000 offshore bank accounts amounting to 12 billion euros. I have a very special story. My story is that I was working for this bank who suddenly asked me to delete documents. It will make you think of what happened in the past in Switzerland where uh, there are other people at UBS in Switzerland who were asked um, to delete the name of the descendants of the people who died during World War II in the camps in, in Germany and in Poland. Uh, it was President uh, Clinton who, under the pressure of the Jewish lobbying in New York, had to somehow attack UBS in Switzerland because there are so many descendants who were claiming for the accounts, which UBS was refusing to give. So somehow it was another fight between the US and Switzerland. And you had someone, I don't know if we can call him a, a whistleblower, who was um, a security guy working at night, and he found those listings, and he wondered what it was. And instead of deleting them, he brought them to the CIA. And 
people to whoever in the US or the FBI in the US. And it happened that the US was able to collect so much money from this from these accounts. So somehow my story took place more than 10 years later where I was also asked to delete files. And when you delete files, you don't just delete paper, you delete the memory. The memory of your work, the memory of this company. And in France, it's a criminal act to ask someone to delete a file without a written email, a written paper, a memorandum, whatever. So I refused to delete that and I was asked to delete the names of all the clients um, who were attending all the events I'd been organizing for 10 years at UBS because I was the head of marketing and communication. So I refused to do that because I did not understand. As I said to many journalists in France, it's as if you as a journalist, your boss was asking you to somehow delete all the videos and all the interviews and all the papers you've been writing for 10 years. What what does that mean? It doesn't make sense. So as of the time I started refusing, obviously I was harassed, I was put aside, I was isolated. Uh, it led to the fact that I had, I did a depression. So well, it was a really, really big and complicated story. But we are back in 2008. So I filled in a complaint against the bank because I was like, if one day there is a search, if one day there is a problem, they are going to tell me that I was responsible for those uh, wrongdoings. Forgot to say that this request to delete documents happened after a search in the office of the general manager. And this is very important. So I filled in a complaint and I thought that my job as a citizen was done. Uh, and a couple of months later, I received a call from the customs, the French customs, the head of an, an investigation uh, cell, who asked to see me. I was like, why? And although I was in this weakened state, although I was being harassed by my company, which they knew, they asked me to take files out of UBS after a search in the office of the general manager, I was asked to delete files and archives and I refused to do it for ethical reasons. I filled in a complaint against UBS and I saw that I had done my duty as a citizen. I was in a weakened state. Many people have asked me why I didn't leave the bank, but I didn't leave the bank because I was a single mother with two children and my only income was my salary. So I wanted to recover and be able to find another job at a later stage. So I was still at UBS when one day I received a call from the head of an investigation cell within the customs department who asked to see me. And I was like, why? I haven't done anything wrong. And she gave me, a, a, well, she gave me a, a meeting, she asked me to join her on the Champs Elysees to meet with her. And uh, we were joined by a colleague of hers, and they've told me that they would follow me during two weeks with investigators, uh, people with cameras, uh, in Roland Garros, the famous um, French tennis tournament, because I was working there for two weeks. And I very naively, I said, no, but nothing is going to happen in Roland Garros anymore. I blew the whistle. I refused to delete files. And now we have no Swiss people in the bank anymore. I don't see them on the events anymore. And they said, yes, yes, Mrs. Simon, we are absolutely convinced that there will be Swiss people with French clients in Roland Garros. And it happens three or four times that I bumped into uh, a Swiss colleague or that I met French people accompanied by uh, by uh, Swiss bankers so I understood that somehow UBS was lying to us was lying to their employees how come where well, we said that there's a kind of Chinese wall now between Switzerland and France and having those people around and so these are the things that I had to work out with them 
processes, name of clients, name of bankers, uh, a lot of uh, confidential information that they asked me to take out of the bank, to extract out of the bank. But as I was in a state of fear, I was living like, you know, an animal when an animal during a hunting session is absolutely terrified of the rifles. I was living a nightmare. So when I heard of those people, I was like, but they are going to save me because I haven't done anything wrong. My big fear was that I would go to jail and that I would never see my kids anymore. That's why I'm so sensitive to Julian's case because I was like, I cannot be separated from my children because I've refused to delete files. It doesn't make sense. So those people are going to help me. And somehow UBS must have heard that I was working for them because UBS knows everything about them being everything. the government. Yeah. And I was made redundant. And obviously I had thought that I would be protected by the government. But then once I wasn't able to give information anymore, I never heard about those people anymore. And this is how I understood different processes. Like somehow, would my enemy be UBS, who's been extremely mean with me? Harassment, discredit, isolation, making me redundant? Or is it the French government who's refused for years to recognize my actions? So I've taken UBS to court several times. Each time I've won, the case has never been appealed. And now we are in 2023. I'm the only one in France have been recognized as a whistleblower with a new laws by what's called a defender of rights. And guess what? I still do not know when the trial will take place. The trial. Yeah. Versus UBS. And on the other side, I won twice versus the French administration, the French state. I was recognized as someone who's been working for them which means that they have to pay me to retribute my work for them and they should have protected me so I should be uh, recognized financially by everything I've suffered because obviously with a story like UBS you can find a job anymore obviously with a story like this when you have no job and you have only trials what can you do with your life? You just live a state of harassment all the time. So my case is at court again next month. So you already won a defamation case against UBS, right? In 2008? And they didn't contest that decision. <laughs> but you say you've been to court several times. Why again and again? What would the, the Because it's situation? different courts. You know, it's France and this is it. You discover what justice is. When you're a normal citizen, you think that court is just the day you would divorce or the day, I don't know, you would have a water leak with a bad neighbor, but you don't even realize that, you know, if you are living in an apartment and you have water leaks everywhere, you would have to go to court versus the neighbor or whatever. But you don't understand what it is to go to court versus a multinational company or versus the state. In France, for example, when you go to court versus the state, it's a special Court. It's called Tribunal Administratif because it's administration. When you go to court, UBS, you have criminal courts, you have police courts, you have a social court, and you are absolutely lost because you have a first lawyer saying you must do this, and then you realize that the lawyer is not extremely ethical, and they ask you lots of money. So how can you defend yourself when you are a citizen versus? It's two big ones. So if France really fa fight tax evasion, at least they should help me to fight UBS. And if UBS is their big enemy, they should have really hammered UBS during the trials. But no, somehow the sentence UBS was a very light sentence. How come? And how come we have the answer is that the UBS offshore accounts are in the number of 40,000. Can you hear me? 40 Southern UBS accounts. And among them, you have top politicians. And this is where the problem is. Top French politicians. And French politicians. And they knew one of them was the, who was the Minister of Budget when Francois Hollande was the president. And it was a quagmire because obviously all the politicians, left wing and right wing, 
all supporting him, saying in France, you know, you are innocent before being uh, judged. You are innocent before eventually being made guilty. But how come you have everyone supporting someone who was fighting tax evasion and who himself had his accounts at UBS with bribes from a uh, pharmaceutical laboratory to pay for his political party? You see how corrupted those things are. And this is absolutely hidden from anybody. So as long as I could help them, it was very cool. But when they started realizing that themselves were among all these pieces of information, obviously they have put my file aside and then go to hell, you can just hang yourself. There's absolutely no option whatsoever. And the citizens are somehow very far from that because mainstream media do not talk about this subject. They just talk about, you know, tax paradises, tax evasion. They are extremely vague. There is no uh, serious investigations about what I would say. And obviously it's my own purpose. So just to be clear, for those four years, I'm not sure if it was the whole period between 2008 and was it 2012 that you were laid off, the government was asking you to provide information to help them retrieve what ended up being 12 billion euros in uh, funds that were lost through tax evasion and money laundering, etc. But what you're saying is what I'm hearing, and let me know if I'm hearing it right, they only went so far. They didn't go as far as a situation where the politicians themselves in the French government would be exposed. And that's part and parcel of the reason why UBS was hardly punished for that reason. Do I have UBS that right? is one of the most powerful financial institutions in the world because UBS has a PEP, which, which stands for um, Political Exposed People all over the world. In my book, you have references to uh, American uh, press clippings about the same problems in the United States. And this is also something I discussed with uh, Julian eight years ago, namely regarding the Clinton family, the Clinton Foundation, and regarding uh, the Obama uh, problems. And we were like putting pieces of a puzzle together because he knew things and I knew things. And you know, it's as if you're two pieces of an apple, you know, like. Uh, and this is where it's explosive because if these, these 40,000 accounts were published by Russian hackers, by whoever hates France, and there are many people who hate France now, and there are reasons to hate France, but our state is going to collapse. Our state needs ethical leaders, needs ethics. You cannot claim being the country of human rights and not protect the people who work for you. I worked as an agent in my company, although I've never been an agent in my life. I was an executive, I was a mother, I was a marketing specialist, I was a communication and PR specialist. What is that you have asked me to do that knowing the sensitivity uh, of knowing how sensible the information is but it's absolute madness those guys are criminals and this is why now you don't have anyone who's a whistleblower i told you earlier there are no whistleblowers in banks anymore now you have leaks you had uh, anonymous leaks Pan uh, the panama papers you had the paradise papers you had the dubai papers you had the marshes files you had the football leaks Blah, 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 blah. Who would just stand up for the truth within a bank with a story like mine? I mean, it's absolutely madness. Is it the government that ordered, I'm assuming it was the French government that ordered UBS to pay you 30,000 euros? <laughs> 30,000 euros, right? Uh, he did not even pay the legal fees. Which was my next question. They gave you 30,000 euros, which is ridiculous, a ridiculously small amount, uh, considering the monies that you 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 helped to retrieve um are you comfortable giving an estimate of how much you paid in legal fees in your defend defending yourself against ubs in court this was for uh, my second trial my second trial had cost me thirty-five thousand by then so it was 2014 oh it's nine years ago 
And uh, yes, I gained 30,000. So somehow you go to court to lose money. Who forces you to go to court? It's a lawyer who says, you're gonna win, they're criminals. So you believe him, you give him your life exactly like a patient would give his hands, would give his life, would give his body to a surgeon who would have to um, operate the heart or to start the surgery. You believe that the lawyer tells the truth. And then you realize that this is nothing to do with protecting you. It's just another wheel of the system. You know, you're just in the spider web and he has a role to play. He makes you believe that when you go to court, you're gonna make lots of money and then uh, you are going to be repaired. But you are never told that the amount you make is this because somehow this is the way that it is. And you discover that afterwards, when you meet other people who have been to court and you've been uh, suffering and you tell them, no, no, no. But the amount is the same for everybody. And you're like, why do they write pages and pages and pages and pages about claiming this, claiming that, knowing that everything is going to be refused afterwards? And this is it, you know, when you are being harassed uh, and you are in a weakened state, you cannot understand that. I really thought at the beginning that my enemy was UBS. Then I understood lawyer after lawyer that it was a whole system. Can you imagine that my first lawyer, I don't talk about him in this book, but in my previous book, he used to work for UBS. I learned that afterwards. So you are being defended by someone who works for UBS? But I mean, like... Shouldn't be allowed. And those guys should be in jail because it's a lack of ethics, right? Of course. Nobody talks about it. There's not a single media talking about that. Bradley Birkenfeld. Oh. 104 million US dollars. Can you talk about that? Oh, if I, we start talking about, UB, uh, about Birkenfeld, it may be really difficult. Birkenfeld is a so-called whistleblower. But this is what people know, what people hear, what people understand from the interviews he's been giving and from all the papers these past 15 years. Brad Birkenfeld was working in Switzerland for the American market. He left with, I think it's 15,000 uh, bank accounts of American, well, the American people. US, UBS clients. UBS, US clients. It was when uh, Obama was president and Clinton was Secretary of State. And when the story exploded in the US, somehow Hillary Clinton asked the Swiss Confederation to hand give her 4,450 accounts out of the 15,000. And once again, you, are, you can really wonder why, <laughs> why only one third of, of the accounts were needed. And the same, it's because all the politicians in the US have offshore accounts at UBS in Switzerland. PEP, the PEP desk, the PEP desk, and the head of the PEP uh, was at court at UBS, uh, uh, was at court in, in the US, and uh, obviously was made uh, non guilty So, in France, it's the same. It was under investigation. It was not made guilty during the trial. Everything's like this. It means that it's always the ones, you know, who disclose. It's always the ones who work, so who are persecuted. The others are protected. But who protects them? And this, this is it. You know, it's a whole thing. Uh, it's very difficult. So the case with Birkenfeld goes far beyond that. Because he was um, contacted by the French judges to testimony, whereas I have never been. You know, for the I'm talking about the tax evasion trial. And not only that, but do you know which document, which documents he gave to the judges? He gave my documents. 
documents I'd been giving it to him when I spent a week in Boston at his house, at his mansion, uh, where he was telling me that he was uh, fighting tax evasion, that he was a whistleblower, that with the money he had got, he wanted to uh, set up a foundation with one leg in Washington, one leg in Paris, and that I would head this uh, organization because I had no job anymore. We are in 2023. I haven't heard from Birkenfeld since. So he used information about illegalities, or let's say at that time, alleged illegalities, that you had discovered, that you had in your possession and given to him to earn himself 104 million US dollars. No, it's not exactly that. It's, uh, I met him after he made all this money. But I mean, how come can an American guy with nothing to do with this market who's left the bank seven years before me, left in 2005, can be listened to by a French judge with documents which belong to me and I've never been listened to by the judges. And if you look at the, at the judgment, it's 170 pages. My name is mentioned 50 times and my position. So you're like, but, and the whole system is corrupted. Don't make me wrong. The whole system is corrupted because why would French judges somehow uh, pull people who leave abroad who have nothing to do with the company I was working for, I've left the bank more than 10 years before the trial without, you know, investigating more. So what is the UBS story, really? Who is Bradley Birkenfeld? How come is he so unethical? How come is he not supporting whistleblowers other than the interviews he gave to the media? I'm saying that uh, UBS is his enemy. UBS is the devil. UBS is Lucifer, Lucifer. And uh, then you wonder what could have happened with UBS with Birkenfeld, with the United States. And now I understand. It took me a very long time to understand that somehow this was initiated by the United States to lower the power of UBS. Because if you look at the four biggest financial institutions in the world, Vanguard is American, State Street is American, the third one is... Um, BlackRock, sorry. BlackRock, State Street. Third one is UBS. So UBS had to be lowered to make sure that the American interest would raise. And the Americans played like a poker game or like the chess game. What did they do? Because of the pressure they put on Switzerland, the OECD had to organize all the countries in the world to sign um, the agreement, you know, the bilateral agreements between countries. All the countries in the world had to sign, except one. Which one has been signed? The United States of America, which means that somehow they eliminated UBS, they weakened UBS, and at the same time, the only one in the world which remains a very big tax paradise, which is number one in the world today, is the United States of America. And the President of the United States used to be the center of Delaware. Delaware, which is the safe. So you understand? It's a coup that they did against UBS. And nobody talks about that, it's the same. Dear Confed is being perceived as a whistleblower, but we don't know. So it's possible that he was a willing accomplice in what you describe? As you say, it's possible. You talk about how hard it is for whistleblowers and how no one has come forward to do what you did because of your example, because you were so badly treated. So. Uh, I want to ask you about things that you've talked about in the book, Whistleblowers, about what can be done to help 
uh, make it easier for people to come forward to do the sorts of things that you did in the public interest. Uh, there's strength in numbers, uh, one for all and all for one. Um, but talk about that, that general principle. And the French quote, one for all and all for one, yeah, it comes from the four musketeers, you know, uh, from Alexandre Dumas, from French literature. Well, this is the only thing we have to do, and Julian stood up, started to give information for all of us. So all of us have to stand for him. Can you say that again now that that trap is passed? Because it's a very important thing that you just said. What I said is that Julian stood up and gave us information. He gave it to all of us. So all of us have to stand for him because we have to stand for the truth. And as I'm French and we have this writer, Alexandre Dumas, very famous name in French literature, who had written about the Four Musketeers motto, all for one and one for all. This is exactly what we must do for Julian. We must all stand together, whether we are in Asia, in Africa, in South America, in Europe, in the US, in Australia, wherever we are located on this planet, we must all stand up for the truth, because the truth is that wars take place everywhere. It was uh, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, two bases, Ukraine. We know that things are really bad in uh, Africa at the moment, but who enjoys the game? And obviously it's not the citizens. So yes, the only thing we can do is to gather internationally to speak one voice. One voice is the one of the citizens and to defend our rights. You see Global is currently on trial in Spain for spying, alleged spying, on Julian Assange. Well, I say alleged, but there are images of him all over the web uh, from the Ecuadorian embassy during the time that it was UC Global providing the security. You say that when you entered the embassy eight years ago today, they took your cell phone and uh, I guess whatever other electronic equipment you had. Do you think that they opened it up, opened your equipment up, your cell phone up and um, took information? think that there's a possibility that they were tracking you or might still have the capacity to track you from that information that they may have taken as they did uh, allegedly with others. I guess so because as I said before when I arrived I had a cop who asked me who I was and who I was visiting. I was very reluctant to answer those questions but I had to. I had no choice. I was cornered you know and obviously I wanted to see Julian. I couldn't, uh, couldn't leave. And um, <coughs> I am pretty sure that it happened that my cell phone was attacked. I mean, I guess it was already the case in France or with UBS, but then maybe with the US, maybe with the UK, possibly. Julian thinks so. So Julian thinks so. So you had that conversation? Because, yeah, I mentioned that. He asked me where was my phone. He asked me what happened with the cops outside. Uh, because obviously it was important for him to know what was going on around the embassy. And uh, yeah, obviously, uh, what do you want me to say? We know since Northern that we are under a mass surveillance uh, system. So with people as sensitive as Julian, I am sensitive too with my case. Even though everyone thinks it's only a French case, in this list they also are foreigners. They obviously are. So it's a huge thing. And as long as the information is not shared with people, people cannot understand what's at stake. At stake is that we ask everyone to pay, to pay more VAT, to pay more taxes, to have public services getting worse and worse every day, whether it's uh, hospitals, it's schools, it's transportation, it's whatever. And at the same time, you have the ones who speak in our name or who should speak in our name, who are the first ones to be criminals, the ones who lie, the ones who cheat taxes. But what is that? Once again, why do we teach our children to tell the truth if we live as an adult in a world of lies? <coughs> My final question is going to be about Day X, but before that I'm curious to know whether there were supporters for Julian standing outside the embassy that day that you visited him. Sometimes, well, it's a question of numbers, but I'm curious if, if there were at least a few that day. I remember 
that it was a Friday, Friday 28th of August, and um, at, at 2 p.m. And uh, no, there were cops in the street, but there was nobody in the street. There were no no supporters because it was a working day, and I think it was still the holidays in England by the time you know school holidays, and people were not here. I remember that London was quite empty, so because it's a long weekend, you know, because this Monday is a bank holiday, so it was the same. It was a Friday, uh, with the Monday was a day off. So no, 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 there were no supporters. I, re I remember because there were only cops outside when I was there. There were at least three, one on each side and one in front. So I arrived there and I was each side of the staircase. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the street, you know, the embassy at the corner. So you had one on each side of the embassy and one on the other side. And when I entered, there was one at the table, the one who asked for my name and uh, who asked me where I was going to and who I was visiting, who I had a meeting with. If I was announced, I mean, I had many, many questions to answer. These are the only people I saw. No, there were no, there, there were no demonstrations outside. There were no supporters the day I was there. Stephanie, in your own words, can you describe what day X is <laughs> and what uh, what your your fears and your hopes are for Julian uh, with day X in mind? We desperately are waiting for the date of this last audition at court. And I sincerely hope that all the journalists who say that they stand up for Julian will really stand up and, I don't know, be on strike internationally or be here in London. You know, somehow London will be the capital of the world, the capital of uh, you know, our democracies, uh, putting uh, a journalist in jail. So what I'm hoping is that there's a surge, there's a tsunami, there's a wave of uh, citizens from all over the world, of, you know, big figures, people like uh, the singers, like rock stars, like uh, show business, like all the ones who somehow enjoy being so comfortable who don't even understand that you know the, 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 the word of the citizen is the one who's to be shared worldwide so i hope there are going to be people from all over the world uh, and that obviously it will help for the decision to be in favor of Julian because we know what it is it's a political case so what is political is always like uh according to who is involved and how many people it's a balance you know so if you have many 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 people obviously then uh, uh, one day in an interview i was comparing uh Jupin's case to mandela and uh i think it was four or five years ago but it's about the same you know when you are single in your little cell and nobody cares if you can say but if people start screaming People like saying justice. Justice is a word that has a meaning. What is justice? What is journalism? What if? What is freedom of the press? What is freedom of speech? Did Julian put anybody in danger? No, he did not. And the ones who say the opposite, talking about the, the Chelsea Manning uh, documents, are wrong because all the names were, as you know, uh, uh, hidden from the public. There are other people who published with the names, or other people who put other people, but we never talk about those. So Julian never did anything wrong. Julian and WikiLeaks were a little publication who did what they could to shake the world, to wake up the world. Uh, somehow, yeah, they are the, the intelligence services of the citizens. We all are concerned by, by what has been said, whether it's corruption, whether it's wars, whether it's uh, tax evasion, whatever it is, and we really miss them. And the very good news is that even if WikiLeaks had been criticized, etc., WikiLeaks has, has big seeds everywhere, and there are many WikiLeaks babies all over the world, you know, there are many, uh, we are talking about hackers earlier, there are many people who do not want to participate in this big lie anymore. So I think that the audience, the day the audience is known, yes, London will be the focus, the center of the world, because we cannot accept that this guy be extradited. What for? For publishing the truth. Let's read once again, read Juman's uh, text in my book.
it's absolutely unbelievable that all the guilty ones, all the criminals, are the ones who rule the world and they go from one organization to another one and they all send the ball to each other, you know. And at the same time, they are the ones who should be locked in jail. So where are the judges? Where is justice? Day X, it's when that day is announced, it's going to be 9 a.m. outside the Royal Courts of Justice in London. Are you going to be there, Stephanie? Depends where it is. Uh, at the moment, I'm here. So if it's soon, I'll be here. Yes. <laughs> if it's soon, I'll be here with pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for what you did for the citizens and the other residents of France. Thank you. Free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange. Yes. Uh, free us all. It's not only about Julian. Obviously, it is. And, uh, and we think, I think personally of his children, as I said before, nobody can say that they love their kids if they accept that what is done to these kids uh, is possible and happens, you know. You cannot have two little kids here in England. In the United Kingdom is supposed to be a democracy separated from their dad just because he is a publisher. I mean, this does not make sense at all. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to give my blessing.